Matthew chapter 10, please. Matthew chapter 10. We are getting to the tail end of Matthew chapter 10. And uh, I hope it's been an encouragement to you. I'm confident it has been a challenge to you. I know it has been to me, and uh, hopefully it has been to you as well. You know the old saying, it's better um, to give than to receive. And interestingly enough, within um, Christian, um, the, walk, the way um, principles, uh, Christians both give and Christians receive. Uh, we give to God, we give to um, fellow Christians, we give to mankind, and at the same time, we receive different things. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit this morning, but I would, I, I would point to something you'll probably notice in these verses, and that is in the first two verses, the word received is used um, eight times. And so that seems to be pretty significant. You know, I don't know what the percentage is. It's somewhere between 15 and 25, but I didn't excel at math, so it's in there. Two primary features, or one of the things people receive is, is rewards. Jesus has talked about rewards before leading up to this, and he's going to talk about it here a little bit as well. And two features of a reward is you think about its value. What, what value is the thing that you are getting worth? Um, we probably all won some kind of little pendant, um, a little piece of plastic. And if you're a four-year-old and you win the race and you get this thing that looks like a gold medallion, that's probably pretty valuable to you. But if you were uh, an Olympian who had dedicated your life to running some kind of event and they gave you that same piece of plastic, that would be very valuable, would it? You know, you want the gold. Where's the gold, man? So, you know, there, there's a, a value aspect of getting certain rewards. And then, of course, there's the purpose for which a reward is received. What, why did you get this? Not only why, but what is the value? But a reward is unlike a gift. A gift has no strings attached, it is free. Um, if, if somebody demands something for a gift, then it's not a gift, okay? It's a barter system. We talk about as Christians, the gift of salvation through Christ, and we don't have to give in Christ anything. You've heard people say, Oh, I owe Jesus my life because he saved me. Well, that sounds good, but it's not true. You should give him your life, but you don't have to give him anything. Or he wouldn't be giving you a gift. Does that make sense? Right? So look with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 10. And for those of you who haven't been keeping up with this, if you read earlier all of chapter 10, Jesus has been preparing his disciples, and he's had some really challenging things to say. I mean, it, quite honestly, this it, chapter 10 has not been an encouragement. It's, it's been, hey, you're going to die. <laughs> kind of like that. You're going to go out, and you're going to do what you're going to do. You're going to say what you're going to say, and you're going to pay for it. But that's Jesus' words. I'm sending you out uh, as sheep among wolves, and they're going to kill you. That's not encouraging. But then here in verses 40 through 42, Jesus says, whoever receives you, receives me. Now, if we just stopped right there, that's enough. That's the mission. To go out and share Jesus with people, hoping, anticipating, at least to some degree, they're going to receive what you have to say and who you have to offer. And if they do that, they receive something else. 
And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Well, we know, and Jesus has clarified earlier, that this is the Father. And they do everything together. And so it's not like two different things. To get the one is to get the other. Verse 41, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Verse 42, we change gears just a little bit. And Jesus says, and whoso or whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple. So, so there's a qualification for this thing. I Truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now that's encouraging. If you do even the simplest thing for one of these little ones, you're not going to lose your reward for giving it. So we're going to try to, unusual text, but we're going to try to break that down and understand it a little bit better this morning. Father, we do come before you in Jesus' name, and we are grateful for this text. What an encouragement. It, it is encouraging to think, to know, that um, you um, both enable, equip, and have called us to share you with the world. What a privilege. And we, we should want to do that. We should joy in doing that, even with the suffering that your son has promised. But, but to think that you reward your people for helping those who minister out is encouraging both to the minister and the person helping them. And, and, and that is a, an offering, a gift promised by you that nothing will take away. You're committed to it. We don't deserve that. We, we should gladly just do it. But then you heap blessings on top of that. Thank you. Help us as we look into your word this morning, not only better understand this text, but exercise it and let that be pleasing to you. Let it bring honor and glory to you. And Father, I pray that you would draw men to yourself through your word, redeem them to yourself. I ask this and so much more in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus, again, has been teaching, really warning of the negative aspects of discipleship. And, you know, it's nice to think of discipleship, you know, living for Jesus as all, you know, kumbaya and happiness and, and, and all that. But it's just not. And we've talked about that over and over. Christianity, I was telling my Sunday school this class this morning, I've, I've heard it said before that, um, you know, churches for women and children. And I've always contended with that theory because living for Jesus is the hardest thing you'll ever do. You, you're rejected by people you love, people you like, a culture, a world that doesn't even know you just because of Jesus. It's, it's a painful thing. You may lose everything. You may be a wealthy person with a business and God calls you to a ministry that's relatively poverty. You, that's hard. Living in a world that we exercise principles and philosophies that are contrary to the world and the world looks at us like there's something wrong with us and, and we defend ourselves. And it's logical and obvious, and to them it's dumb. You know, that's hard. So if you think that living for Jesus is for children and, and women, you're probably not man enough to, to live for the Lord. Does that make sense? 
Living for God's tough. Think about the lilies. They're going to PNG. And they're going to be living in difficult places. I don't think there's a Walmart anywhere close, is there, Greg? No. And how many people say, I'm not going to the mission field where there's not a Walmart and a Starbucks. Well, we just found out who the tough guy is, didn't we? Yeah. So in Matthew 10, verses 43, 42, Jesus gives some very uh, positive and encouraging things to his disciples. And they're probably ready to hear it after the first 39 verses. And Jesus, I just want to cover quickly three aspects that Jesus gives to the giving and the getting relationship of the ministry. The first one is the evangelistic aspect. Look at verse 40. Jesus says, whoever receives you receives me, and whosoever receives me receives him who sent me. So these people are what we think of as an emissary or um, a, a, an ambassador, someone who goes to a foreign land or a foreign place and to tell somebody about somebody else. They are not there for self-exaltation. It's not about them. I am just uh, the messenger. I don't matter. I'm not a big deal. But the one that I'm referring to, they are the big deal. They matter. And, you know, just a little side note. One of the things that bothers me a lot about Christianity, contemporary Christianity, is the, the notoriety that some people seem to want or even demand. And too many Christians are willing to give you know, uh, the big name, the big ministry, how many people do you pastor, you know, whatever. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a potentially a bad thing. So be careful of that mentality. Can I be transparent with you? Um, I've told God, I want to be the best preacher ever. Now, now, now when, we, when we hear that, we think notoriety. I want to be the, the, the most well-known preacher ever. That's not what I said. That's not, but that's maybe what we think. I don't want to be the most well-known. I don't want to be the richest. I don't want to be the whateverest. What I want to be is the best preacher ever. And if, 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 if I'm the best preacher ever to Hunter's Creek Community Church and just 200 plus strong people, what a blessing that would be, wouldn't it? Even if nobody, ever, it doesn't matter. They don't matter. I mean, we've got a bunch of people all around the world that are watching us. But they, they're not my people that I pastor. But I want to be the best preacher ever. Shouldn't you want me to be the best preacher ever? <laughs> you know, not so you can go around and say, we got the best preacher ever. But so you get something from here all the time. So I'm not ashamed of it. But I'm not looking for glory. I really don't, I don't want that. And you shouldn't want that. So don't exalt people for things like that. Exalt them for what they're giving or who they're giving in this case. Remember when the disciples went out and they did all kinds of miraculous things, Jesus sent them out two by two, and they came back and they were exalting, you know, for what they, exalting really, and what they were doing. Oh, man, people did this and that, and we healed people and cast out demons, this, that, and the other. And Jesus stopped them in their tracks. He says, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice in the fact that your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. But why? Because that's what matters. What matters is not the man, the ministry, the community. What matters is the message and the God of glory. That's what matters. And it should matter to all of us. It should be our message. Being an emissary for Jesus is an often repeated theme throughout Scripture. In John chapter 12 and verse 44, John said, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. You know what Jesus is doing? Now, now, he's the Savior, but what he's doing is he's saying, don't look at me, look at the Father. 
I, in my mind, I've always kind of seen the Trinity as like, imagine if you will, and this is a goofy thing, I know, please forgive me, but imagine being in like a pile of gold coins and, and, and God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all in that pile of coins, right? And they have a shovel. And each one of them is trying to scoop coins into the other one's area. Because they're looking out for the good of that one. And, and you can't seem to do it because every time you give a scoop, you get a scoop. And so you have this cycle of going around and around and around of each other glorif glorifying each other. That's what they're doing. And that's the way it's supposed to be. God glorifies the Son and the Son glorifies the Father and they both do that through God the Holy Spirit. John chapter 13 in verse 20, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whosoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So now, Jesus has, and, and this is an amazing thing. Jesus has incorporated men into this glorious ministry of exalting God. We, we have the privilege of telling a lost and dying world about the Creator. Have, have we lost sight of the glory of that? Have we forgotten what a, a privilege it is to be a representative of Jesus Christ? Let me see if I can put that into context a little bit. Imagine if um, your favorite president, whoever that is, said, I want you to be our representative from the United States to whatever country. If you like China best, pick China. Maybe it's Israel, whatever. And you get, you get to go over there and to the coolest place you know and eat the coolest place. I'm thinking somewhere in the east because I like baklava and stuff like that. So that's what I would be doing. It, it surely wouldn't be, you know, Bangkok. So you, and that's where you get to go. And you get to tell the world and represent Jesus. I mean, me, the president. You would be in high cotton. You would think you're somebody. Man, you've arrived. Which president is worthy of more glory than the God of heaven? If you're shaking your head like a couple people are, you're right. There ain't one. But see, it was kind of cool. We were fantasizing in our mind about going to Israel and representing America. We don't fantasize in our minds about the joys of telling people about the King of Heaven. And we should. That's who we represent. So Jesus was an emissary of the Father, and we are His emissaries. A disciple is God's tool for the gospel. I was telling my Sunday school class this morning, I am, I am grateful for a variety of ministries. But which ministry has God promised to bless evangelistically? The Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. How shall they call on Him whom they've not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the thing that God has promised to bless, to bring people to Christ and to glorify his name in redeeming them. It's the scriptures. VBS is great. Sunday school is great. But I have not found that verse that says, if you have a good VBS program, what a glory to God. Not that it doesn't do that. Don't misunderstand me, but you understand my point, right? The scriptures do that. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. 
Romans chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. The Apostle Paul said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, you know that from evangelism. How then will they call on him whom they've not heard? Answer that question. Answer it. The, the, the obvious implied answer is they can't. And how are they to believe in him whom they've not heard? I mean, if you, if, if, if you don't tell them about Jesus, you know what people do? They set up totem poles. They throw their babies to the, to the alligators. They're going to they're gonna do something to worship, but whatever worship they do, it's not going to be God's way and God. But they're going to do something because they're made in the image of God. It's in them to worship. That's why we say here at Hunter's Creek, there's no such thing as an atheist or an agnostic. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, y'all know how I feel about feet. I think they're ugly. And every time I read that verse, I feel conviction. <laughs> Paul said in Galatians 4:14. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. That's how people who see you as an emissary for Christ will receive you. So we have an example of what is meant by our partnering with God here in this text. Reception of Christ is reception of God, and that is salvation. The second aspect in verse 41 is the ministerial aspect. In verse 41, Jesus says, The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Now, let me be quite honest with you. I would love to wax eloquent about this verse, but it's a very difficult verse to understand and mean because we don't see this like really played out a whole lot in the Bible. This isn't a common theme. And so I read up by what people mean by that. And some people mean, well, if they receive you, they receive Jesus. Eh, that doesn't sound right because he just said that, you know, in verse 40. So I, I think it's a little bit different than that. But what it does mean is that to, to receive because of or in, in the way of, by the same means of, you're receiving, that person is receiving the very character of God when they receive the gospel of God. They, they, are, they are receiving that person who's going to them as an authorized agent of the sender. So when Jesus gives the gospel charge in Matthew 28, go, here Jesus is saying when they receive you bringing me, they receive me and my father. You are, an, you are literally authorized as a believer in Jesus Christ to take that message. It's your message to give. The world can't give that message because it's not theirs. God has both called, ordained, authorized, and empowered his people to give out his message. And it seems like more specifically, these prophets and righteous men, and we'll see in a little bit, a bit these little ones in verse 42. The reward given we are unworthy of, but what is it? I don't know that I can authoritatively say because I'm always skeptical to say something Jesus didn't say. Like if he, Jesus says, you know, we'll do this, and unless he says specifically what the this is, I'm reluctant to kind of put words in God's mouth. 
You, you, is, am I making sense there? You agree with me? But, but as I think about Scripture and I, I look back at prophets, what I do find is this, this contrast or this dichotomy uh, as to how um, the men of God are received. And how they are received is going to dictate what happens to or for or with the receiver of that person. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, okay? In Acts chapter 13, you can turn there because we're going to read a few verses. Verses 6 through 11. And then go ahead and turn to 2 Kings but keep your finger in Acts because we're going to be in 2 Kings in a second. Acts 13, verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Limus, Elimus the sorcerer, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. What a horrible thing to turn someone away from Jesus Christ. That's abominable. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil. Now, was Paul being mean? Was he, was he being, yeah, he didn't worth all that. No, Paul's being very adamant. This is, this is a big deal when you try to keep somebody from coming to Christ. That is devilish. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. Will you stop at nothing, make it crooked, the straight paths of the Lord? And now, watch this, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time immediately. Mitts and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord, not the miracle of Elimus, at the teaching of the Lord. He received Paul's word. Elimus did not receive God's word. So you see a contrast in what reward who got. Amen? In 2 Kings, I, well, I'll just read verse 23, chapter 2. This is Elisha traveling. He's on his way up to Bethel, and while he was going up, on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, bald head, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. Can you imagine? Now, I know what you're thinking. Are you, what? Come on, Elisha, have a little grace. Have a little mercy. What these guys did, God saw as tragic, abominable. Now, I use that example not just as an example, but let me, now say this as your pastor and as your brother. Be very mindful how you talk about preachers. If you don't like them, that's fine. I don't like everybody. I mean, I've got preachers. I don't like them. I don't like their personality, whatever. But, but if, he's a, if he's a preacher that God has called, then that's God's business, not mine. People didn't like Jesus either. You, nobody's ever going to like everybody. Okay? 
But just because you don't like them, you don't get to talk bad about them. Now, I'm not saying somebody, you know, God's going to send a she-bear out to rip up your children. I seriously doubt that'll happen. But we can certainly see where God frowns on that. It would behoove you to not talk bad about God's man. We've always, we've often heard about eating the preacher for lunch, right? Don't do it. And, and I know this sounds self-serving. It's really not meant to be. This is meant to help you. Don't do that. Don't do that. that might, you might get rewarded for that. Conversely, what we'll see in verse 42. And then in 2 Kings chapter, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17, I'm kind of reluctant to read it all because we have three baptisms, but I will. One day Elisha went out to Shunem. There was a wealthy woman uh, lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there and eat food. So she's doing him a good deed. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put uh, there for him a bed, a table, and a chair, and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there and he turned into the chambers and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite when he had called her she stood before him and he said, and she, he said to him, say now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. I want you to hold on to that phrase. You have taken all this trouble for us. Basically, you made a, a little suite onto your house. Imagine adding a prophet's chamber. It's what we call a prophet's chamber to your house just in case the pastor comes by. That's essentially what happened, okay? And he said to him, say now to her, see you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood at the doorway. And he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And he said, and she said, no, my Lord, O oh, man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived and bore a son about that time, time the following spring. As Elisha had said to her. Do you, do you see what God did through the prophet? Because of her generosity, care and concern she was rewarded even in her old age with a child. Now, last I checked, within a year's 12 months. So imagine pro, um, relations happen. Imagine the anticipation of that woman every time relation happened. And she's thinking, is it this time? Is it this time? Is it this time? And then one day... She realizes there's a change in her. Can you imagine the excitement that, that this woman's having? And, and every time she sees that prophet's chamber, she probably thinks, Elisha, God did this for me. God rewarded my goodness to the prophet. Later on, I, I love the story, but later on, this kid is about to die, and, 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 and uh, it, it, I'll get it. I'll preach it one day. It's a great sermon. But this is a positive thing. The same kind of thing happened for Paul on Malta in Acts 28. And Paul is shipwrecked there, and the people treated them well, but the one guy, the leader of the island, treated him very well, and God went and performed a miracle for them. 
It's the long and short of it. So, so we do see some glimpses of this reward concept for honoring God's man and God's word, which seems to fall in line with what Jesus is teaching here. Our primary message is the gospel, but be careful here. Don't preach the gospel for the goods that might come along with it. The preacher is wrong for trying to pastor a bigger church because a bigger salary comes with it. We are wrong if we try to get in good favor with the preacher. Or we do good things for God thinking that God therefore will do good things for us. We don't do good to get good. We do good because God has called us to good. I was telling my D group yesterday, if you, if you look at the New Testament, particularly the Pauline epistles, and you just read them quickly, and you think how many times the idea of good works is, is used. Over and over and over and over. We are called to good works. We are created to good works. But we don't like to think like that sometimes because we're thinking, okay, well, if we talk about good works, people think we're works-based salvation. Two different things. You, you, you're not works-based salvation if you do good things. Do good things. And that's what we're going to see here in just a second. In fact, look with me at verse 42. Whoever gives one of these little ones, this is where we get our, um, our word micron, micrometer for you engineers. And whosoever gives one of these micro people even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. You think, what, what's a cup of cold water? That's not like building a house. That's not like building a room on your house. Big difference. But, but, but Jesus is emphasizing the benefit and the blessing of doing just the smallest thing for the least important people. We got prophets, we got righteous men, and we got little ones. Insignificant nobodies. You don't have to be the John MacArthur's of the world. Oh man, I met John MacArthur and gave him a cup of cold water. If you give any of these emissaries a cup of cold water, God has promised to bless that. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that exciting? But again, you don't do it for the blessing. You do it for the privilege of doing it. Doing good, giving and receiving are part of our ministry. They're part of our life. They're part of our work. And size and quantity don't matter. I've been a part of a culture that, you know, talked about, you know, winning people to the Lord and, you know, won nine people today and seven people last night and six people yesterday as if numbers mattered. Some of you came out of that same culture. And what we forget is numbers aren't up to us. Size isn't up to us. Preachers do this all the time, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons. Well, they'll, they'll say, well, well, how many people do you pastor? And what they want to know is, how big your church is. Well, it's not your church. It's the Lord's church. We try not to say that. But you see what they're doing? They're kind of jockeying to see who's got the biggest ministry. Who's the biggest man on campus? You might have forgot. You're the, you're the micron. <laughs> you're the micron man. Not mega man. Micro man. You're nobody. I'm nobody. It is the privilege of privileges to go out and to share the gospel, even if with the backdrop of the rest of Matthew 10 means you're going to pay for it. It is still a wonderful privilege. Cold water, crucifixion. Yeah, I'll take that job. That's what we're called to. 
I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 21 to, to get a perspective on, on what's God's view of giving. Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Jesus looked up and saw a rich, saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw the poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, now this is Jesus' words. This is authoritative. Truly, I tell you. The same truly as we heard a while ago. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. She's exercising great faith out of apparently great love. That little bit she gave, that little cup of water is far more than what most people give. What about little people? How does God see people? Well, look with me at Matthew 18. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, and you can kind of see this coming, even, you know, what they're doing. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I mean, who's, who's got the biggest church, Jesus? Who's preached to more people? Who's got the biggest ministry? And calling to him a child. A, just a child. Now, this is not the same word as we saw a while ago, micron. Micron is just little, not, not much of anything, relatively insignificant. Uh, this is... Uh, this child is like Pat Pat Pation, like a, you know, Star Wars Padawan. It's, it's just a, a, a little learner, a, a child that's learning. But, but Jesus pulls this little child to himself in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So isn't it really cool to see how Jesus kind of puts all this together for us sometimes? You know, he connects the dots. You're not anybody. But God can use nobodies. Right? I think I'd rather be a little body than a big body. Receiving Christ not only gets us eternity and all that comes with it, the, the, the benefit of receiving Christ is multitudinous for sure, but it, it's to get God. I, I get God. Somebody and I were talking recently about the gospel. Is what is the gospel? I think Piper has a book, John Piper has a book called uh, God is the Gospel. He is. What a privilege it is to represent Jesus Christ. Our baptismal candidates can go ahead and prepare two over here and one over there. But not everyone will receive Christ. It, it is a painful thing to preach the gospel and watch people walk away. I'm reminded of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do? And Jesus says, give these commandments. And he says, all these have I kept from my youth. 
And then Jesus says something striking to him. He says, go and sell all that you have. Think about this now. Go and sell all that you've got. Now you're no longer this rich, young ruler, but you're a, a micron, a nobody, a poor nobody. And take up your cross and follow me. And, and one of the saddest statements to me in all of the Bible is the commentary that that rich young ruler went away sad for he had great possessions. The reality is there are people who will not give up what they've got in order to get the God of heaven. And we look at that and we think, what a shame. How, what shall a, pro a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We, we know that. But there are probably people right now in the hearing of my voice and they're not going to give up their goods. They're not going to give up their God. They're not going to give up their position, whether it be wealth or popularity. They're not going to give up the denomination they came from or whatever the case might be. And we look at that and we say, foolish. And it is foolish. But there's people who will even turn away the greatest of gifts in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 10, the Apostle Paul told the church at Thessalonica, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused the truth. Not because they were bad people, not because they were popular, not because of this color or that whatever, because they refused the truth. And there are people right now in the sound of my voice who will not come to Christ but refuse that truth, even though in their heart right now they are being drawn. They feel that welling up. They feel that conviction. And right now in their minds they're thinking, is he talking to me? Well, I'm not talking to anybody. But if you're thinking that, that's probably God talking to you. Because I've felt it before. Many of us in here have, right? We know what it's like. That's probably God knocking on your door, if you will. It would behoove you to proverbially let him in. The one Jesus says in Luke 10, 16 who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. To reject this message is not only to reject Jesus, but to reject God. What a shame. What a pity. So it would behoove you to come to Christ today. What does ministry look like? Eh, ministry can look like a lot of things. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, building a CE building. Somebody at some point built this. And it's nice. We have a lot of stuff here. It's good. Sometimes it's just a cup of cold water. Sometimes it's an encouraging word. That's ministry. And everybody needs that. 